Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'm going to convene this meeting. Um, first item on the agenda is going to be the minutes of Wednesday, July 28th and Wednesday, August 4th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve minutes of Wednesday, July 28th and Wednesday, August 4th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you. Next, I'm going to uh, call on Michael Barber, our general counsel, to announce a couple of rate decisions. Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I need to announce the board's recent decisions on the 2022 individual and small group rate filings. Um, and probably should just start with a, a little bit of background. So um, as a result of legislation that passed during the most recent legislative session, uh, the individual and small group health insurance markets in Vermont were unmerged for 2022. And this meant that Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont and MVP Health Plan each submitted separate filings for their individual and small group plans. Uh, unmerging the markets had the effect of lowering small group rates and increasing individual rates compared to what they otherwise would have been with individual rate increases being offset by expanded premium tax credits available as a result of the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so starting first with individual plans, um, based on the filings, uh, there are approximately 31,000 members covered by these plans with membership being split pretty evenly between the two carriers. Blue Cross requested a 7.9% average annual increase for its individual plans, which it lowered to 5% based on the recommendations of the board's contracted actuary. And then they increased their request to 5.2% following the submission of hospital budgets. Uh, the board approved a 4.7% average annual increase uh, for these Blue Cross plans. MVP requested a 17% average annual increase for its individual plans, which the board reduced to 12.7%. Moving to the small group filings, um, according to the submissions, there are approximately uh, 40,600 members in these plans with 21,858 members enrolled in MVP plans and 18,000 755 members in the Blue Cross plans. Uh, Blue Cross proposed a, a rate change of negative 7.8%, which it increased to negative 6.4% based on uh, the review conducted by the board's actuaries, and then increased that again to negative 6.2% following the submission of hospital budgets. The board approved a rate of negative 6.7% for these Blue Cross plans. MVP, meanwhile, proposed an average annual rate increase of 5% for its plans, which the board reduced to 0.8%. <clears throat> so I know that was a lot of words, but uh, it was a little complicated this year by the uh, four separate filings. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. So next on the agenda, I'm going to turn it over to Executive Director Susan Barrett for uh, an update. And also, I'm going to ask Susan to introduce our present presenter and presentation this afternoon. So, Susan. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mike Barber, for getting uh, that announcement out. I'm glad you were doing it today and not me. It was very complicated. Um, so I want to remind the public that next week the board will start our hospital budget hearings. Um, they are all going to be accessible via Teams. 
And we do have a physical location at 144 State Street in Montpelier to comply with the open meeting law. I will mention that all board members, staff, and presenters will be presenting via the teams remotely. We have a couple of ongoing special public comment periods. One is related to uh, and is about the FY22 hospital budget submission. So on July 28th, 2021, we opened the uh, special public comment period for the FY22 hospital budgets. This will uh, go through September 1, 2021. Um, on, as I mentioned, the hearings start next week and then the deliberations for the um, these uh, decisions start um, September 1. The board will make a decision on the hospital budgets no later than September 15th. So we ask that uh, folks submit public comments prior to September 1st to be considered by the board in deliberations. Um, the second ongoing public comment period is on a potential next agreement of the all pair model with our with CMMI. Um, we this is we opened this comment period earlier this year and, it, and we continue to take these um, comments and we we ask the public to please provide these comments. We are sharing anything on that potential next agreement with CMMI and any public comments with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as both AHS and the governor's office are taking the lead on the negotiations for a potential next agreement. So with that, I will move to introduce our speaker today and give you a little background. Uh, today, we welcome Shule Garovich, who is a senior fellow at Mathematica Policy Research Group. She'll be presenting to the board on avoidable utilization in rural hospitals. Before I share a little bit of uh, background on Shule, I wanted to mention that her presentation today adds to the ongoing work and discussions the board is undertaking on rural healthcare sustainability. As the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the state of Vermont, and by virtue of that, Vermont's hospitals transition to value-based care. And as such, these hospitals will be more increasingly accountable for cost and quality. We, wanna, we want to ensure their sustainability in this value-based world. I think the presentation today will uh, talk about ways to do that. Um, and I hope that it will inform both the board, the public and our stakeholders. So now I'll transition to introducing Shule Garovich. As I mentioned, she's a senior fellow at Mathematica Policy Research Group. She's a lengthy bio and I won't go through everything, but I think I'll pull out a couple of things that may, um, I think are very interesting for our discussion today. So Shule manages the state health policy portfolio at Mathematica and she's an expert in healthcare payment policy, alternative, alternative payment models, global budgets, all payer models, and quality and performance measurement. She has a really extensive experience with uh, state health policy in Maryland, Pennsylvania, here in Vermont, of course, and Massachusetts. Um, Shule, I actually met Julie years ago, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago when we were just really exploring um, the potential for an all payer model. Um, Shule worked at Maryland's, and I know I'm going to get, maybe I'll get it right, the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission um, for many years. And um, her expertise, both in uh, data analysis, quality, uh, quality, health quality metrics, and uh, the work she did. Uh, down in Maryland really informs her work that she does for, for states today. Um, I will also mention that um, Shule has, also has a clinical background, having worked as a clinical nurse for six years in inpatient settings. She also has a PhD in public health from Bloomberg School of Public Health and an MPP, Master's in Public Policy, I hope I have that right, yep. 
from the same university. And there's more, um, but I'd, I'd encourage folks to look at her uh, bio on the Mathematica research, uh, research uh, policy website to learn more about Shule. But I think I will turn it over to you, Shule, to share your presentation. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you for that introduction as well. That Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Great. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, I think it was about six years ago. What I remember is you all came down to Maryland to talk with us, and I had the terrible pharyngitis, so I ended up not being able to talk with you. Um, but I'm glad we had the opportunity to meet in person, and I really enjoyed working with Vermont um, and thinking about these challenging issues. Um, as a, as a, a kind of person who work with multiple states, um, maybe my perspective on Vermont, I'm going to start there and then we'll go to the presentation. Uh, Vermont is one of the three states who are really at the um, trailblazing end, looking at the reform, uh, both from the delivery side and from the payment side. You have been in the long journey, um, you know, blueprint and before that medical home models. Um, so you are far ahead in, in, the, um, in this journey compared to many other states. And the way that um, Vermont is dealing with sustainability in rural health um, is a, an advanced model and and i'm hoping that it will help other states as well as you work through these thorny issues um, and and create a sustainable healthcare finance for rural health so with that i'm going to see if i can share my screen and um turn to the presentation mode um Okay, um, can you see my slides? Yes, we can, yep. All right. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, a little bit about Mathematica. As Susan mentioned, uh, we've been working to support uh, GMCB around all pair uh, model monitoring reports. But Mathematica has been um, supporting public and private sector policymakers over 50 years. And our strength um, is really bringing the data and the policymakers together to think about how we can use uh, analytics to uh, improve healthcare and, and social services. Um, with this mission orientation to uh, improve public well-being, uh, we've been working in what we call a data lab. Um, data donation lab is uh, aiming to bring the um, data to the decision makers and looking at variations in total cost, quality, and access, um, both from the payer perspective, provider perspective, and population perspectives uh, to help with the healthcare reform uh, that we are here to discuss a little bit today. Um, we process the national Medicare and Medicaid claims, um, and we are producing a publicly available reports on our websites from our work. Um, there is um, about 10 people who are working on the innovation lab with me. Um, I won't go into the details, but I just wanted to acknowledge the, the, the team behind me who really worked hard to create this dashboard and published it on our website. Um, the interactive dashboard is focusing on rural health. Um, as you all are aware, um, we have tremendous challenges and disparities in rural health, both in terms of access, uh, high burden of disease, uh, as as well as uh, high quality uh, of care that is provided to this population. So we focused on rural health for our uh, dashboard and wanted to give information to help decision makers how to think about value-based payment models and, and create new models to bring the delivery reform and the payment reform together. Our goal and our audience is really hospital executives and hosp hospital policymakers. So a lot of the information that you're gonna see today is thinking through the policy levers uh, that we could use to improve um, the care and provide high quality care in rural areas. So I'm gonna go into a little bit details. Um, so what we did in this dashboard is we measured avoidable hospitalization um, at rural hospitals. So what does that mean? Um, so this is a concept that has been used in many states um, and it is defined as a 
unplanned uh, care, and it is a care that we think would be prevented if we have a better ambulatory care settings. Um, so I wanted to give you a perspective with the other measures you may have heard as we are thinking about healthcare reform, which is termed waste or unnecessary care. I wanted to make a distinction here. What we are looking at here is an avoidable utilization. It is really tied to population health. Um, so it is not unnecessary uh, once we arrive at the hospital door and from my um, experience with the inpatient care, um, this is very true to my heart. Um, when you are at the hospital, you definitely need that care. Um, so we are not talking about unneeded care or waste. What we are talking about here is a population health-based uh, utilization where really, if you look at these measures, um, we could design uh, population health-centric uh, policies and reform uh, to, and to improve and reduce avoidable utilization at the hospitals. The measures are uh, based on claims data. So these are the billing statements provided by hospitals to the payers. And we flag these um, claims into three categories. One is readmissions within 30 days. Um, second is ambulatory care sensitive admission. So those are two inpatient measures we have. And the third one is looking at the emergency department visits and looking at avoidable emergency department visits that are not admitted into the inpatient setting. So I'm going to go into detail a little bit what these measures are and how we modified it for this purpose. The first measure is a 30-day all-cause readmission measure. Um, you may have heard about this measure in other settings. Um, federal government as well as private um, payers have been using readmissions as a quality measure for hospitals and adjusting their payment rates uh, based on whether they have high readmission rates or low readmission rates. Um, the measure looks at whether the patient is readmitted to the hospital within a 30-day period of their initial discharge. The idea behind is that if there is a care coordination and support services for the patients following their discharge, uh, they should not be coming back to the hospital and those admissions could be avoided. Um, the measure is validated nationally by NCQA, um, and it is also used in the HEDIS uh, measure sets uh, for the private plans. It excludes plan service lines, um, such as um, pregnancy, prenatal care conditions, uh, transplants, rehabs. It's really looking at the, the admissions where um, we think that they, with the with the co care coordination and better primary care, um, these admissions could be prevented. For our purposes, since we are looking at hospital finance, um, we only count if the patient is coming back to the originating hospital. So this is a subset of the readmissions that the quality measures look at uh, because in our in our terminology, we would like to give the hospital executives an idea of how many of their admissions could be prevented that are coming for, to their hospitals and originating from their hospital. So the idea is the patient is using a rural hospital as the main source of their hospitalizations. The next inpatient measure is ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Um, this is again another nationally used measure by ARC. Um, it is also called as prevention quality indicators, PQIs. As the name suggests, um, it is focused on prevention um, and ARC calculates these measures at the geographical level. So they do have reports looking at county level uh, PQIs measuring all admissions for the residents of that rural county or urban county. The idea behind these measures are the, um, if you look at the condition list that I listed here, uh, these are all chronic conditions and with a better care management and pre prevention um, public health interventions, these admissions would reduce at the hospitals on uh, diabetes, uh, COPD, hypertension. Um, so these are all chronic measures where we do have um, uh, some evidence that with the prevention and public health, we could reduce these admissions at the hospital. So we took those two algorithms and created an inpatient measure for avoidable utilization and looking at the percent of revenue that are coming from these two measures in the inpatient side. 
Emergency department visits are in other places where we could look at this concept and look at avoidable utilization. And here uh, we have a, a, a somewhat of an old algorithm developed by New York University uh, about 20 years ago. We adapted this algorithm and updated with the new um, ICD codes. But in this uh, basic algorithm, um, it is looking at the primary reason or diagnosis for the ED visits and, and creating a um, three different classifications for ED visits. The first one is non-emergent care. Um, so those are the conditions where um, they really didn't need the emergency department for, but for various reasons, um, they, they showed up in our um, ED departments. The second one is emergent, but primary care treatable conditions. So these are um, the, um, th there was an urgency for the condition, but if they had better access to primary setting, we hypothesize that they are not gonna be coming to the emergency department. So this um, is in a, a good example is, um, ear infections for kids, uh, right? So uh, those kind of urgent care um, conditions could be treated at the uh, office setting rather than emergency department setting. And the third one is an emergent um, ED care needed. So this is the highest level of visits where we do know that the ED was the appropriate setting, uh, but again, with a long-term planning and effective care, um, those conditions could also be prevented. Um, so those are the three measures that we have um, in our dashboard. Uh, and before I go into presenting some results for Vermont, um, a few other details uh, as you're looking at the results. Um, the first one is um, what we present here today is a, a results from Medicare fee-for-service only. So this is the traditional Medicare plans. And when you look at other payers, Medicaid or commercial payers, what we see is the Medicare population has the highest utilization rates in avoidable utilization. And reasons are multitude, but as you know, um, the chronic conditions are more prevalent in the Medicare population. And in the fee-for-service environment, the coordination activities are um, limited um, to manage these conditions in the ambulatory setting. Um, we, the second information is we are really looking at revenues. Um, so these measures are not a reflective of the hospital's performance. So I just wanna repeat that again. Um, we are not looking at hospital performance in these measures. What we are looking at is the impact of the area that the hospital is serving on their revenues. So if you are a hospital or a policymaker and you're thinking about value-based purchasing and uh, financial opportunities for these hospitals, to improve population health, um, this is the revenue impact of those potential value-based purchasing um, that I'm gonna get into towards the end of my presentation. It is not risk adjusted. Um, and the, when you compare hospital to hospital, we also need to be very careful to think about what other services hospitals are providing on the outpatient care. So the revenue percentages are impacted by the denominators as well as the actual cons from the avoidable utilization. We included hospitals located in rural areas. Um, so this is defined by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And some of these hospitals could be large hospitals serving not only the rural areas, but also the urban areas. Um, so I wanted to point out that, um, so the, the, um, the rural definition is really based on the location of the hospital, not the people that they are serving. And, and finally, um, as there is an overlap between inpatient measures on the readmission and PQIs at the preventive quality indicators, we counted them as a PQI um, to reduce the duplication and have an accurate percent on the, on the revenue. Um, so if you have other information around readmissions, uh, you may think that our readmission rates might be low um, and that's the reason um, why readmission rates might be lower than the PQI. So we can't really judge whether they have a higher readmission rate versus a higher PQI rate. So this slide is the hospitals that we flagged as rural hospitals in Vermont. Um, and it is showing the percent of revenue in avoidable utilization on the inpatient side. Um, we separated the uh, readmissions from PQI 
us. And as you see, there is a wide variation in both measures as a percent of revenue. Um, just to orient you to the results, um, the highest ambulatory sensitive admission percent is with Grace Cottage Hospital with 33% of their inpatient revenue in avoidable utilization in PQIs. When we look at the pink columns, it's looking at the readmission counts. Um, and here, the range is uh, between uh, 7%, the lowest at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, um, to 14% uh, in several hospitals um, that are shown towards the end of this table. The second one is the emergency department. Um, so here you have um, a much higher percents. And if you think about the ED um, and the um, in the ED utilization, um, this is not surprising to us um, that over 30% of the ED utilization is potentially avoidable. And when we bring together inpatient and ED, um, what we see is that um, the floor of this is around 20% uh, and the highest are around 37%. As you're thinking about your hospitals and sustainability in the value-based purchasing, um, these are the potential opportunities uh, depending on how you structure value-based purchasing with these hospitals for them to improve their um, community access and work with the community providers to uh, reduce avoidable utilization. So you could think about it that way, um, as well as as the uh, utilization declines in these hospitals as a result of these value-based purchasing, it creates challenges for the financing of these hospitals and how to maintain access to care in rural hospitals. So from there, we could think about uh, different policy applications of these um, results and, and how you can think about um, utilizing a data-driven approach. Um, so as we talked about the value-based purchasing, um, we are witnessing a different models in um, alternative payment models um, and, and from and they are different based on the specialty or the type of provider I provided a Two examples based on the specialties for primary care. We have medical homes emerging in a lot of places, um, and it's been a more over 10 years um, development of the medical homes models. Uh, we have accountable care organizations, and you are all familiar with your all payer model, how accountable care organization really bridges the gap between primary care and specialists and hospitals. And for specialists and hospitals, there are also episode-based models which look at um, hip or knee replacements, for example, and how we can create efficient and coordinated care focusing on special um, procedures or special episodes. What is common across all these models is our goal is to create um, incentives that are aligned to provide better coordinated care and high quality care. And the cost savings from these models are usually coming from reduced hospitalization and, and better uh, post-acute care utilization to avoid hospitalization. So a lot of the work and the literature um, up to date is looking at the savings from hospitalizations as well as post-acute care utilization. So if you think about what I presented um, earlier, I created this two fake examples. So if you have a model in aligning financial incentives and you are trying to coordinate care and reduce cost, we have two examples here. Hospital B is about 25% uh, avoidable utilization um, in, in their revenue and hospital A has about less than 20%. So if we are trying to improve care, uh, which hospital would you focus? Hospital B has more opportunities, uh, but it could also present more challenges in terms of the social determinants of health, access to care, and the ambulatory setting. Hospital A has lower opportunities, and it may also have similar challenges, or that there may not be additional improvements that we could expect from hospital A, given their low utilization rate um, on in the avoidable utilization. I um, 
copied the slide that I like a lot in terms of where we are and where the uh, payment models are um, moving towards. As Susan mentioned, um, we are working towards creating new designs for the finance and move our system from fee-for-service to um, what, what the um, federal government and the uh, private companies coordinate as the population-based payment models, which is category four. Um, so in this models, uh, what we have is a classification of financing uh, from fee-for-service, which is the category one, to category four, which is considered to be the most advanced payment models that really looks at population health and provide incentives for providers to coordinate care um, and removes the barriers of the fee-for-service, which is um, fragmentation and getting paid for doing more rather than preventing and improving population health. Um, as you can imagine, fee-for-service creates this um, challenge for our provider um, community. Um, on the one hand, finances are dependent on how many admissions you do or how many ED visits you have versus the medical community where they focus on patient needs and try to improve population health, which in turn may reduce hospitalization and admissions and impact the um, hospital's finances adversely. And we see that in the rural health very starkly. Um, so this graph shows um, the hospital closures in, in, in rural areas um, and looks at the uh, prior to 2010 versus 2010 and onward. Um, as you see, we have a lot of yellow dots in our national map. Um, so this is um, these issues are not unique to Vermont. So we are observing a national trend in rural hospital closures. Um, and there are multiple reasons why we are seeing this trend increasing and it, we may see actually even more closures in the future. Um, but there are very significant impact of rural health hospital closures to their community. And, um, and from there, our take on uh, message is, um, we really need to think about this collectively and merge the delivery reform with the payment reform and the PAUs could provide a data-driven approach for us to uh, create um, some alternative models and, and work on sustainability. In these new models, um, we need to focus on community needs um, and improve access and um, data in the PAUs would has been providing couple examples and, and how they, um, they structured their payment models using this data. Um, so the models that are using PAUs in, from this perspective um, are three. Um, the first one is in Maryland um, that started um, as Susan mentioned when I was in Maryland, um, and this, this is again a 10 year period for Maryland, um, that we started working with the first rural hospitals to create um, global budgets with the rural hospitals in the state. And later we, we created these budgets for urban hospitals as well. And in the latest stage of the uh, Maryland model, um, we are now focusing on improving total costs and trying to align payment levels uh, between hospitals as well as physicians and ambulatory care setting. Um, the other example is Pennsylvania Rural Health Model, uh, which started five years ago. And this model is really focusing on rural health um, and leveraging the um, state to coordinate uh, the policies across commercial and, and public payers. And the most recent example is coming from CMS. Um, CMS instituted a new model called Community Health Access and Rural Transformation uh, chart model. Um, and building on the experience from these two states, um, they created two tracks. One is a global budget for hospitals and providers in a community. And the second one is accountable care model, which takes um, some of the lessons learned from Vermont, as well as some of the other rural health models um, that CMS ran um, in the past. Um, in the CMS model, um, they are requiring um, the uh, conveners to work with other payers, um, and they are looking at especially the Medicaid departments in the state to coordinate and recruit private payers um, and bring uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial plans um, around global budget uh, for rural areas. 
what is a global budget and there could be different names but essentially global budgets are fixed revenue models um, so you establish a revenue base for the hospitals um, and in this revenue base it's usually based on historical revenue and you adjust the revenues not only how many patients uh, they treat um, so you you adjust the global budget based on quality, efficiency, and adjust for uh, shared savings with the payers. Um, so the fixed revenue really takes the um, the equation to a new level, um, and it is not a claims-based fee-for-service payment, but uh, hospital receives a set guaranteed revenue for the full year and, and create transformation plans to improve population health in exchange how the PUs play in the fixed revenue. So I, I provided a very simple but complicated graphs um, in this example. Again, if you remember our hospital A and hospital B, uh, we have a, a two scenarios. We have a 10% PU uh, in hospital A and in hospital B, we have 20%. Both, both hospitals under fixed global budget is going to receive a hundred dollar as a fixed revenue in this example and based on their PU levels hospitals would save and create opportunities for population health improvements if they reduce their PUs under global budgets um, as they reduce their PUs which are the red arrows here they get to keep the revenue um, because their revenue is set at hundred dollars for from the payer's perspective, how to ensure savings to population and um, reduce our uh, rates. Uh, we would create shared savings looking at this targeted avoidable utilization reductions and gradually reduce the revenue percents from $100 in the first year to incremental changes uh, to ensure that the savings are shared with payers and, and the population. Um, so in both Maryland and Pennsylvania, potentially avoidable utilization have been very critical to help hospitals to create transformation plans, look at their data and understand where the community um, needs are. Um, so they've been doing detailed analyses of the top uh, conditions that their hospital is receiving in avoidable utilization and working with their communities to create new services if they are required or change their practices to ensure that the care is coordinated um, with the goal of reducing avoidable utilization over time. Um, so with that, um, I will stop here and um, answer any questions you may have. Kevin, you're muted. <laughs> you let me go on for quite a bit, Jess. <laughs> and and you, yeah, you, gave me a, <laughs> you gave me a heart attack. I'm like, oh my God, was I disconnected? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh. thank, thank, thank you so much, Julie. That was a, a lot to digest in a short period of time. And I'm going to open it up now to uh, board questions and comments. And I'll go in uh, reverse alphabetical order, starting with Tom. Yes, a lot to digest. I mean, my mind is going between uh, this presentation and the reality of house, hospital budgets uh, staring me in the face every day these days. Um, I, don't, I don't quite know where to start with questions, because there's so many. Um, but uh, first, at a practical level, have you worked with any individual hospitals where these concepts have been applied and can, uh, you know, and, and, and where, where the results are, are clear and can be pointed to? Because I, I find that this, this concept here of the two canoes uh, with a, a foot in one canoe and a foot in the other, that generally whether it's insurers or or providers they prefer the bigger foot in the fee of service um, canoe um, everyone seems to genuflect to the concept of of of, of uh, quality care and fixed payments of some sort capitation of some sort but it just it seems to be in a small corner of the world 
and 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 not getting a lot of momentum and growth. Um, and uh, um, so, I, I, you know, I I think it would would help if 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 there are specific hospitals, you know, that we can point to to say to our hospitals and to our providers, look look at here. Uh, here here are examples of where we can be. Wow, great question, Tom. Um, <laughs> so a couple things. So I think the longest experiences with Maryland global budgets, you are right. So we, we talk about value-based purchasing and fixed payment, but until we fix this issue with, you know, getting paid on a fee-for-service versus having this marginal value base, right? At the end of the day, what we saw with the readmission quality uh, adjustments that CMS implemented, they were getting dinged by a small percentage of their revenue. They couldn't afford to lose the readmissions from the finance perspective, right? And it is a reality and it is the rational thing to do if you are get paid on a per service. In Maryland, uh, we have, as a regulatory agency, um, we have collected a lot of information what hospitals did once we established global budgets. Um, setting the payment model is not enough. It is a culture change. What we experienced with Maryland in the initial years was even though we thought that the incentives were aligned, culture wasn't there yet, right? So it takes a while for hospitals to leave that canoe and jump fully into the value-based world where um, you look at your services from a very different perspective. There are very good examples in Maryland, and I'll, I'll be happy to connect you with a few of them uh, that implemented that strategy. They use data and they looked at their ED utilization and they start tracking which patients were coming uh, for what purposes and they created additional services to support these hospitals. Some of them did um, social determinants of health um, and they are working with kind of reducing prescription drug costs or creating um, some food uh, support for their uh, patients to reduce, again, hospital utilization. But they are guaranteed on the revenue side, right? So they, that's the, the, the big one that uh, kind of changed the way that they implemented their um, services. I, I guess if, you know, a lot of um, provider community is hesitant um, on the value-based purchasing, I, I'll say okay. even if they are not participating in those, it is coming. As I pointed out, all other models are looking at hospital utilization as a cost savings. So if you don't implement value-based purchasing involving hospitals um, at the end, especially for the rural health community, we are gonna be in a place where hospitals would start closing and who's gonna provide the services if the major, um, you know, employer and the uh, infrastructure is going to disappear without any sustainable model. So whether hospitals do it themselves or somebody else to do them um, is the conversation that you may want to have with the hospitals to understand what their perspective is. Um, finally, um, one model that is kind of getting me into that direction is um, CMS started a new model called DREC purchasing, uh, and um, you know the details are many, but the idea is um, to create contracts with external entities for them to start thinking about this, um, providing services and, and purchasing them directly from the providers, and that is gonna create additional financial pressure for the provider to negotiate and, and um, kind of do uh, analysis like we did to, to create the, um, uh, you know, per member, per um, per month type of analysis to reduce costs. So whether hospitals are in or not, um, you know, will become irrelevant in a way because this this is the the field and it's going towards as I as I showed you in the graph towards the population based models um, and it will come five to ten years um, to to everywhere. So based on just your observations. Uh... You know, I think in the last year, the board has spent some time trying to nail down what the quote unquote tipping point is uh, for uh, value based payments where these reforms begin to yield the kind of benefits that everybody hopes for. And um, so we put a condition on our ACO to 
get us a report in that regard. And they've submitted a draft, I think, and staff is scrubbing it now. Um, but do you, uh, and, and our hospitals, we can see have been pretty flatlined for the last two or three years at around 14% uh, in terms of their revenues being the broadly defined fixed prospect of payments. Uh, capitation rates are much lower, but broadly defined with some kind of risk sharing or something of that sort. It's in the uh, 13 to 14% range. Do, do you have any sense about what a, you know, a, as this thing unfolds, value-based payments unfold, where, where the tipping point is, where hospitals be, can, or providers can begin to say, Eureka, th this is working. Um, uh, you know, uh, value-based payments uh, is, is working. Uh, we do a lot of evaluations at Pathmark of the federal models, um, so I would kind of need to talk with them a little bit on the tipping point, but from my side, like one is about the impact of those models, right, Tom? And it is, it takes time. Um, so it does take a few years for the implementation to get into the levels that we want them to be. It it has to be at the patient point of contact. So it's it's a little bit of a time question than a a tipping point for flipping the switch and declare that value based purchasing is working. In a lot of the models, um, the expectations are set from the historical um, revenue base, um, right? So if you look at Maryland and Pennsylvania, um, they worked on creating targets for avoidable utilization, and that ranged um, 3% in Maryland to um, about 5% in Pennsylvania. So there is a lot of analytical work to look at this concept of avoidable utilization and how much reasonably we can uh, reduce it over time. Um, there are some studies on the care coordinations and we see 30% reductions uh, given the population that they targeted. But I, my experience with those studies are they really narrow it to a very um, high cost patients and then they sh they show big gains like 30 percent over one or two years which when you apply it to the population level um, reduces the impact and, and reduces the numbers so i'm happy to kind of you know take this offline and and provide you a little bit of detail on the evaluation studies we did if that Great. will help and then one final question this might be totally mix mixing apples and oranges but um, as you know, last year, CMS required uh, the, uh, this price transparency information to be published by hospitals. And, you know, I think everyone here on the ground who's looked at it says it's a mess. You know, it's, uh, it's just, you know, you can't compare apples to oranges, uh, apples to oranges, apples to apples across hospitals. People have defined the coding that they've used differently. They've used different formats of presentation. And so it's really not useful. But on the other hand, it could be useful, um, and I'm just I'm and I'm just wondering whether you folks have crossed paths with that and have some thoughts about gee, you know, if if this were just better organized or on a template that all hospitals would use, there's valuable information here that would help us, you know, uh, see into the realities of, of of pricing across different providers. Tom, um, yeah, I think that reminded me when the EHRs, electronic health medical records, were rolled out um, through the CMS, um, there were no standardization. And we are, after, I guess it's also with the ACA over 10 years, now we are trying to figure out how to standardize and use that data better, right? Transparency is another area where um, we could have impact if people have better knowledge of the prices that they're going to pay, both the patient but also the purchasers, right? So comparative information. Uh, we've been thinking about that a lot, actually, at Mathematica. The, the, the initial reports are going to be probably useful for people like me and like you who could understand the details and make sense of it. It's not going to be useful for the uh, the patients, unfortunately, yet. Uh, but it is the first step, um, in my view, that now we are going to have this data coming in. Um, and collectively, we have to 
work with federal government and the providers to make it more useful. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Currently, we, we, we were questioning, like, okay, what is what is this going to show? And, and, you know, with all the experience we have collectively at Mathematica, we, <laughs> we were puzzled in terms of like making sense of even the data that we got for our own um, on own hospitals. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, but I think that that's a valuable, like you said, to get a better sense of what the prices are in the hospital sector. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next, we'll go to Robin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shule. That was really interesting. Um, and I especially liked your clarifications around um, that this type of a dashboard is really the way I would say it, is, which might be a little bit different than the way you said it, is that it's measuring potentially avoidable care at what we would call the HSA level. So really looking at the community level and and um, it's not all obviously on the hospital to fix that, that would have to be a joint effort of the community as a whole. Um, so I, I liked that perspective because I think it aligns well with uh, Vermont's history and uh, the blueprint and, and our efforts in healthcare reform in general. Um, I was wondering if you had any plans or thoughts about in including commercial data at some point um, using APCDs in the dashboard. Robin, I'd love to do that. I think, you know, for a specific state, we were able to do that um, in, in, you know, in Pennsylvania and to a certain extent, Maryland has been working on that as well. Um, so we could do that with your APCD, right? You guys have the APCD. Other pieces like try to benchmark and try to see, we don't expect them to be zero, right? So the other piece about this is we'll never get to zero. That's not the goal, but what is the reasonable level that we could target um, that will require uh, commercial uh, claims? And uh, we are kind of thinking about whether we could use national claim, commercial claims databases to create a commercial component, as well as using the Medicaid claims that we have access to currently um, and add those two payers into our dashboards. Yeah, yeah. Because from the other thing that we didn't discuss is um, value-based purchasing for providers to invest. So reducing this is going to require investment. And if you do it payer by payer, and this is my all payer, uh, I guess my all payer slant and, and preference. What we observe is if you do it payer by payer, you are not creating enough incentive for hospitals providers to make um, major investments, right? Um, so the more we could think about from an all payer or multi payer perspective, the stronger incentives would be and alignment will be there as well if you are using the same concepts and same definitions. Thank you. Um, I didn't have any other questions. Thanks very much for the presentation. Thank you, Robin. Next, we're going to go to Jessica. Jess? Great. Thanks. And thanks, Julie. This is really helpful. And I think it's going to inform some of the work that we're doing around hospital sustainability and uh, preparedness for value-based payment, which I'm gathering from what you said in the presentation, value-based payments are coming. That's really not debatable. I mean, coming in a comprehensive way, it'll be the primary form of, of payment. I guess that's not really debatable. What maybe is debatable or what we have to think about is are our hospitals and our providers prepared for, for, for that transition? And so this is really helpful in that regard. Um, so I'm wondering if you've done research or Mathematica has done research into what are the factors that are really the biggest drivers contributing to avoidable utilization, whether it's lack of primary care access or lack of access to the wraparound services and community support systems, or is it ineffective care management, or is it you know poor discharge care plans, poor follow-up? In some ways, I'm wondering what are the big drivers, because then that would help us figure out what factors could be addressed, uh, what would have the biggest impact on reducing mm -hmm. avoidable utilization if we understood what are the biggest drivers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I, I think there are some studies in terms of um, like looking at readmissions, what factors impact lower readmissions and how providers implemented certain interventions, right? Um, but from like we've been working a little bit looking at the associations between certain population health indicators, if you have a higher um, 
prevalence of certain conditions, does that have impact on the avoidable utilization? So we are trying to look at it from the area level perspective to see associations to help with that decision. Um, there is there is a vast literature on the readmissions and avoidable utilization on impact, but I don't think I haven't read any article or any study addressing exactly what you are like comparatively, right? Like comparatively where 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 it needs to focus. Yep. Got it. Um, and actually, with respect to the readmissions, I know you pointed out that the that the measure that you used was readmissions only to the original hospital, and I understand that because th your audience is the hospital itself in terms of their financing and preparedness for value based payment. But in some sense, then that actually means that this is probably an underestimate of truly avoidable utilization because there could be readmissions to other hospitals that could have been avoided that aren't captured in your data. So at the very least, this is you know, probably an underestimate. Would that be uh, right? Definitely, definitely, okay. definitely, yeah. Especially um, if you think about rural hospitals, right? Um, you know, a lot of the readmissions could be happening to um, other centers not coming back to the originating hospital. And in general, uh, we had done some studies when I was in Maryland, 50%. Oh, in general, like average, 50% of readmissions are happening back to the hospital and 50% is going to another hospital in Maryland. So um, if you run this algorithm, um, you know, we could we could measure those as well to measure the overall avoidable utilization. Right, which would be really helpful to understand. Yeah. Um, and then you, you broke down the categories of avoidable ED visits. And if I'm remembering correctly, it was like non-emergent, primary care, treatable, and then emergent, but could have been prevented, right? Yep. And I'm wondering if any of the work that's done here breaks it down by those categories by hospital, because to some degree, understanding you know whether this is what percentage of the avoidable ED is non-emergent might have a different solution than mm -hmm. emergent but preventable. Or you know, I mean, I'm just thinking that it actually might matter what the breakdown is. Yep. Is that yep. something that's easy to do, or has been done, or is Easily it pulled is, out of the data? It, it could be pulled from the data. What we did with the Pennsylvania hospitals, once we created these reports, first they were shocked with that 30% on the Medicare side. They they just kind of, it took a while for them to believe in that number. Uh, and, um, and once we did that, then we provided detailed reports and, and break it down into those three categories, as well as giving them some diagnosis information for them to really focus on what kind of conditions, like detailed conditions are driving the avoidable utilization to ED. And they took that reports and they are working to create some interventions, working with their ED. They put the care coordinators in their EDs to start addressing some of those um, individual diagnoses or conditions that they, they've seen in the data. Do you remember off the top of your head, which of those three buckets seem to be the biggest bucket in Pennsylvania, and I recognize Pennsylvania is different than Vermont, but I'm just wondering, is it more the non-emergent or is it more the emergent but preventable? I need to go back. Sorry, I don't I don't have no that in my head. Yeah, Yeah. no worries. Understandable. Yeah. I just was curious. Um, and then I guess my last question is, you know, when you look at the data for Vermont, um, and I guess I can go back and look on this, you know, this pretty comprehensive website, but I'm just wondering your first pass at it, looking at how does Vermont compare to other similar states? Where do you think we are? Uh, you, I mean, it's similar. I, I didn't see Vermont as an outlier. Um, so the, the, I think the ranges are similar. Um, you know, you see some variation in the hospital. So it is really difficult to do a comparison, right? Because your denominators are different type of hospitals you have. So if you're interested in that type of analysis, then we may want to control certain things to see where Vermont compared to other states, right? So it's really hard to judge in a way whether you have a high or not. Yeah. Okay, I was wondering if it jumped out at you in any direction. Nope. But no. so it sounds like we're, we're right in there with the masses. Okay, those are my questions, Julie, and this has really, really been helpful. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank one you. thing to add, we did historical analyses in the past. It's it's like in the past 17, 18, 19, they are, they are stable. So those trends are not jumping up and down, which is interesting to me. I have to think about that, you know, nothing really changed in the last three years. Do you mean that nationally, or do you mean that for Vermont? Uh, we don't. We didn't run this historically, so maybe that's another one. In the other data that I've seen in in Maryland and in Pennsylvania, 
we ran historical data and percents were similar until, of course, Maryland started their program. So then things started changing it a little bit. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jess. Shule, on, on slide eight, um, you have the uh, list of the uh, conditions. And I'm just wondering in your research if you did any rank ordering um, by frequency or, or cost so that uh, um, there's some type of order to uh, what is uh, costing the system the most in these conditions um, that can be avoidable? Um, yeah, we didn't look at that one. That's another good one. So I'm taking notes on in terms of our next iteration of the dashboard to add a little bit more detail. What I can tell is like from our work, um, U2Is, urinary tract infections, are kind of the low hanging fruit, so to speak, that the providers think a quick, in, you know, good in interventions can prevent U2Is uh, much more so than some of the other like diabetes or COPD. Um, but we didn't run that with the national data to see what you know what that order is. Okay, thank you, Shule. At this point, unless there's a board member that has additional questions, I'm going to open it up to the public. Does any board member have any additional questions? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up to the public for public comment or questions, and please address anything through through uh, me. And I'm going to start with. Um, Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Um, and, and thank you for the presentation, Shule. Um, really, really uh, good work and interesting. Um, as board members said, though, there's a lot to digest here. And, and I think we're just seeing the slides and hearing um, your remarks about them. So um, for the board's purposes, Kevin, we may submit a letter responding to some of what we heard and trying to further contextualize a little bit of, Shule, of what Shule had to say. Um, that so would be that very may, helpful. That, that, that may be coming. Um, I do want to make a couple quick comments, I think, though, since this presentation um, and topic is focused on utilization. And I think given where we are in the pandemic, it's really important at the moment to take at least a second to look at um, a utilization through a current today lens. Um, and, and one note on, on, um, on readmissions before I do that is that I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of factors outside providers control, outside the hospital's control um, that dictate whether someone is readmitted. And that can include whether they follow a care plan um, and are, are adhering to discharge instructions and all of those kinds of things. So that's just some of the context we may provide. But when we get back to utilization through a current lens, um, what I can tell you is that right now, Vermont's hospitals are, are very busy. They're very full. There's a lot of volume and utilization right now. They're busy in the emergency department. They're busy in medical surgical wards and psych units, outpatient clinics and surgical sites, you name it. Um, people are coming back to the hospital. This represents to some extent, at least, if not to a large extent, um, care that was delayed or deferred during the pandemic for very various reasons. Um, and it is filling up our hospital beds and in the mental health space, um, having patients who really need care, seeking that care in the emergency room, often with few options for where we can properly place those people for the treatment they need and deserve. So um, that volume only continues to intensify. And I think you're seeing that in headlines, not just here in Vermont, um, but across the country. And then when you combine those factors with our ongoing workforce shortage and the challenge we face there, um, and which adds to our daily costs on a kind of rapidly increasing basis. It just sort of fuels the notion that hospitals are doing a lot more with a lot less as the uncertainty only grows. And, and couldn't agree more with Shule that at the same time, we continue to make the right steps and be a trailblazer in Vermont towards moving to the value-based payments. We all know the system um, you know, probably would function better with if we, if we could do it on a broader basis. So I think in the upcoming budget hearings, you will hear a lot more detail about the utilization issues I just described, um, probably some responses to the, the slides that Shule shared, um, and, and also, you know, we'll, you'll gain a fuller appreciation, I think, for some of what's going on right now. Um, but we may follow up with additional comments. And until then, Shule, thank you for your work and presentation. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'll call on Ham Davis. Uh, 
thank you, Kevin. I don't know if you could ask for your your, uh, your consultant um, question. Um, um, I'd just like to re uh, just like to know whether uh, in her work whether the you get a metric like either readmission to the hospital or and I and I totally agree with Jessica that the much more important is the revision surgery, and certainly in Vermont, which happens all the time. Um, I'm just cur I'm just curious whether the public knows anything about that. The the, the, the in, in Pennsylvania or Maryland, and let's say that you have you 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 do they publish hospital data about about revision surgery about readmission to the hospital? So basically, Shule Ham has asked whether or not there's any um, uh, public transparency on um, um, readmissions. Yeah, great question. I think we talked about the price transparency and the quality transparency has been a focus as well. Um, as you may know, CMS publishes the readmission rates in their website uh, for the Medicare population. Um, and in, in Maryland, um, they also publish complication rates. Um, so this is the, um, the complications happening during the surgery or during the visit, as well as readmission rates. Um, I, I think public um, transparency is a complicated and a different perspective. So you really need to work hard to make them understand what it is um, and a lot of the payment policy work is happening at the regulatory rev level and it's not their primary goals, right? So I think there is a lot of work to be done um, to take some of this work and create the transparency for the patients to understand what they are receiving. And at the end of the day, um, Maryland did a focus group with the patients um, back in the day when we were trying to prepare for the second phase and patients as well as the uh, providers at the hospital, they they didn't connect, they didn't know about this payment, whether you are paid on a fixed revenue or a fee for service, what they knew, what was changing for, their, for them, right? So we kind of have to have that lens as we're looking at this data um, and, and do more public reporting um, in a targeted and, and a different way. So what I presented to you, as I mentioned, the audience is really hospital, executives and the policymakers. It is not intended for pa for, for patients to use. Uh, can I have one more question, Kevin? Sure, go ahead, Ham. Um, I'm, I'm curious about, one of the things I'm curious about that really has never been, it's been a major factor in Vermont, but, but certainly could be, which is the whole idea of uh, global hospital budgets. I um, mean, the, ho in the, the hospital, in, in the small hospital, the small rural hospital world, all over the country, uh, small hospitals are either going out of business or they are affiliating with much bigger, much bigger systems. Um, will, would, would, uh, would global budgets, if we had global budgets, would, is, do you think it's any kind of a problem that, um, you could take a hospital that just that, that just can't really function as a full service hospital in any effective way. Would the hospital would the would a global budget get in the way of a natural solution to that problem? So Ham, I, I think uh, what your question is, and correct me uh, before I pass it over to Shule if I've got it completely wrong, but is there something inherent in going to global budgets that um, would not create the same type of fix as, for example, if a hospital wasn't doing things properly, um, I think what your natural fix is a closure. Is that correct? Uh, well, yes. I mean, sir, you mean certainly. I mean, we've had that. We, we've had that. I mean, we had a hospital and we've had we had a hospital in Rockingham. In uh, in uh, Bellows Falls, it was exactly like, exactly like Springfield, it just went away. Same thing at Fanny Allen in Chittenden County. Same thing at Curbs Memorial in um, in St Albans. Same thing at Barry City in Barry. And so my question is, you know, my question is, and Proctor. Uh, I'm sorry. And also Proctor. I didn't that know was sixty that, but, years ago. <laughs> but 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 but, but I, I I believe you. The, the question is, the question is that um, 
The question is whether, you know, what to do about hospitals that are very marginal. We, we've got, we've just got, we've got one Springfield out there that has just emerged from bankruptcy. And Fletcher Allen and uh, UVM rescued Porter from bankruptcy. So, so the question is whether, the question is whether, whether, um, whether uh, global budgets um, would change all of that kind of uh, dynamic altogether. Shula, you want to try to take a stab at that? Oh, I will. But yeah, that's a great question. Again, a um, couple of perspectives, right? Um, first of all, global budget is not a silver bullet, right? So it's not going to fix the problem of what kind of services our communities need. And the hospital acute bed concept comes from a hundred years of the, you know, the uh, population needs that originally we need acute beds and we needed to be treated at the hospital. That's no longer the case given where we are in our uh, life expectancy and the burden, right? So it's all about the chronic conditions and management. To me, um, you know, you may call the hospital closure a solution. What is left behind is the problem most likely, right? Um, so global budgets could give you a glide path to transform the hospitals in the community to whatever they need. And the, whatever need is still to be determined. And I don't see a lot of work there. I think American Hospital Association published something recently about essential, and you guys are working on that as well, essential health services. The finance is a, a small puzzle. I think the bigger problem is the delivery reform. What kind of infrastructure we need in the rural communities and how we can how we can get there. Global budgets fixes one small problem that they don't need to chase after admissions and EDs to keep their bed open, their doors open. And I think uh, prior comment mentioned COVID, and I think that that was a little bit of a wake up call for a lot of uh, people nationally about sustainability. You've been thinking about this all along, but others didn't pay a lot of attention about the capacity and creating sustainable health system. Um, if you let these hospitals close abruptly, especially, um, then we are going to be kind of dealing with the problems rather than solution, you know, solution of the problem of the rural hospitals. And one thing, one else to add, yes, there are some individual um, issues with the management, but you saw that national chart, right? So 108 rural hospitals are closing. That tells me a systemic problem rather than a individual management problem. So I think we really have to think about it from the system perspective and, and the population health and what we need. Um, I hope that kind of starts scratching some of the answers and maybe uh, we can discuss more um, if needed. Thank you very much for that. And I, I appreciate it. My question, I think, was badly framed. Uh, I think that you do not have to necessarily just close a hospital. You could, you could shift its its focus from um, from a full service hospital with uh, you know surgical lines with very low um, with very low volumes, therefore very high unit costs, and then a quality question coming out of that. Um, so the question, my, what I meant my question to be um, was not whether you whether the you what the hospital needed to be a clinic of some dimension rather than a full service hospital. But you don't have to go in there. Kevin, I, I got it. That was very helpful for me. Thank you. Yeah, Thank one you. more thing to add. I, sorry, I, Kevin, if I can. Right. Sure. I think that's the problem, right? The fixed cost in the hospital and traditionally our payment system provides more resources if they keep their inpatient beds up, right? Um, and until we solve that problem, we won't be able to transform them into whatever we want them to be. Uh, to me, global budget could give that revenue stream and help them to glide back to that next st stage. Um, the important thing is what are they going to do, right? We know what what yeah. the challenges are. The question is, if you were to give them fixed revenue, what would you expect them to do and what kind of services, uh, you know, you would you would kind of collectively think about hospitals providing in their communities? Yeah, I think the point that Ham's trying to make is a question. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and just to follow up, Pam, I, I take your point to, to be, and you can tell me if I'm uh, taking it uh, wrong, but I I take your point very seriously because what 
I hear you saying and what I agree with, but maybe you're not really saying this and I just want you to say it, is that um, if you were to move towards global capitation, that the first discussion is where the hard decisions are being made because you're determining what is the right care at that institution. So that's exactly, you don't have to that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Ma'am, you, you can just answer Kevin's question. That's my question. <laughs> I think she already has him. So yeah, no, um, I, I, I'm completely happy with it, Kevin. Thank you. You get you get you get coffee, Kevin. At real coffee. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So I did see a hand raised earlier, but it's it's been lowered. Mike Del Treco, did you have a question or has it been answered or uh, I'm all set. It's been addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, any other member of the public who wishes to offer public comment? I'm not seeing any hands raised, but if anybody's uh, joining us by phone, if you would just speak up, that would be fine. So hearing none, Shule, um, you sparked a, a lot of uh, good conversation and a lot to digest. We look forward to hearing back from our hospitals on the conversation that was started today. And um, thank you so much. Um, we know that uh, you're very busy and uh, we appreciate uh, the amount of time that you've put into this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. And um, I'm looking forward to what you guys are gonna come up with and, and work through these. Um, and I'm happy to help any way I can. Thank you, Shulay. So, uh, next item on the agenda, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.